Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another fun edition of the Washington, D.C. Power Platform User Group. Tonight, we're very excited to have Microsoft's Steve Winward here. Uh, Steve is the Technical Director at Microsoft Federal, and he's going to give us a great session on what's new in the Power Platform for the public sector or government clouds. I'm sorry, I messed up the title, but Steve's going to correct me. Over to you, Steve. <laughs> Awesome. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Let me go ahead and share my slide out and then we'll get started here. So one second. Yeah, so thank you for the intro, Jamie. Also, uh, for this presentation, we also have Brad Law, who is also on the federal business applications team as well. And he's going to be going into more details on power of virtual agents here in a little bit. But let's go ahead and get started. In terms of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to do a couple things. One, I just want to do an overview of what our government story is specifically for Power Platform and Dynamics 365, just so that we're all kind of on the same uh, page with that. I'm then going to talk about what are some new things that have been recently added and what are some new things that are coming as well. And we'll talk about timelines. And then Brad's going to do a deep dive on Power Virtual Agents and then also do a live demo of that. I'll then come back and I'm going to show you all something that just launched into the Gov space, AI Builder. And I'll actually show you a demo live in GCC, which is one of our government sovereign clouds. And then we'll wrap up and then we'll have time for some questions. Also, if you have any questions, feel free. You can put them in the chat or you can come off a of mute and you can also ask them during the presentation as well. So first, I just want to talk about what it is that is our government cloud. When we talk about this from an Office 365 perspective or Power Platform Dynamics 365, We've got a couple of different offerings, and if you've kind of been in this environment for a little bit, these are probably familiar, but I just wanted to level set this with everybody so we're all kind of on the same page. Today, from a cloud perspective, we have three different offerings, GCC, Government Community Cloud, GCC High, and DoD. We've got a variety of customers in these various different cloud offerings, and there's different uh, accreditations and security accreditations that we're meeting in these different clouds. Each one of these clouds do have a dedicated purpose, and there's a reason kind of why we have a flavor of these. But one thing I just wanted to highlight is that we have not just like our own Microsoft security standards that we have to be obligated to with these, but there's also government regulations that we're meeting too. And as a result, when we release things into commercial clouds, it does often take a little bit of a delay to land in these government clouds. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we're not just dependent on ourselves deploying the stuff, but we also rely on the, the government to also make sure that we're meeting the standards that they put in place to get to these different um, accreditation levels. That's just a really quick high level. The next thing I want to show is actually what does this look like from an architecture perspective? Now, this first diagram that I have here, this is an end user or government user that's using GCC. And in this case, GCC from Office 365 perspective really just kind of rides off of the commercial Office 365 endpoints. So that looks pretty much the same as somebody that was like in Pepsi Cola using Office 365. But if they're using Power Platform, GCC, that actually lives in Azure for government. And so that is in a different, actually totally different Azure Active Directory environment, which is a .us endpoint versus a .com endpoint. And that's a really important distinction to understand because we have a lot of customers who are in GCC, and some of those customers may have commercial Azure subscriptions, some of those customers may have government, Azure for government subscriptions. And oftentimes we'll, we'll see customers kind of straddling both of those. And I just wanted to share really quickly, one scenario that kind of comes up pretty often in this, in this uh, environment. Today, Power Platform in GCC assumes if you're gonna connect with the connectors of Power Platform, that those resources by default will live in Azure for government. What that means is if that customer also has something in Azure commercial today, most of those connectors won't let you go to an Azure commercial resource. But once again, we have a lot of customers that will straddle both of those. And one thing that we've done kind of in the interim is we do have a workaround for this, where what you can do is you can actually set up a logic app in Azure commercial, which gives you the ability to use the commercial uh, connectors in public Azure to consume any of the resources that you want to out of Azure commercial. So today, that's a workaround that you could use. And the nice thing with that is it's low code end to end. If you've never used Logic Apps before, it's the exact same workflow engine that you would use in Power Automate. And so that's pretty cool. If you know Power Automate, you will learn uh, Logic Apps really quickly and it's easy to get started with that. 
But we also have the product group working on this specific edge case as well. And the first connector that has been deployed that covers this is actually the SQL Server connector. So if you use this in GCC, there's a dropdown. And what you'll notice is that there's two different authentication mechanisms. One is for Azure Commercial, the other is for Azure Government. And if we go back one slide, the reason why we did that is because, once again, customers could straddle either one of the Azure uh, subscriptions, either an Azure Commercial or an Azure for Government. The hope is that over time, more than just SQL Server will let you do that. But in the meantime, we do have that workaround that you can use Logic Apps to, to get around that. Now, when it comes to GCC High, it looks a little bit different. Everything is going to be kind of in the Azure for Government space. And most of our GCC High customers also only have Azure for Government subscriptions. So when you're using Power Platform and you're consuming Azure resources, all of those are probably already going to be in Azure for Government. From a technical perspective, there's nothing stopping you from consuming things in Azure Commercial like we showed before. Just keep in mind that from a security accreditation perspective, you just want to make sure that that's a comfortable posture for that organization. But from a technical perspective, you could do the same Logic App workaround if you want it to consume stuff out of Commercial Azure in that scenario. Azure DoD looks almost exactly the same. The only thing you'll notice if I switch these two slides is that the actual Power Platform instance is in a different Azure region. For DoD, we have dedicated regions, Azure uh, US DoD East and US DoD Central. And so Power Platform, the other thing I forgot to mention is that it's accredited through the Azure for Government uh, documentation. So Power Platform really just kind of lives inside of Azure. Any questions on that before I go to the, the timelines? Okay. So the next thing I wanted to cover are just what are some new things that are coming out in Power Platform specific to our government clouds? The first thing is RPA. And so if you all aren't familiar with that, that's robotic process automation. Inside of Power Automate, we have the Power Automate desktop tool. It was actually uh, from an acquisition of Soft Emotive, and that's what the new Power Automate desktop tooling is from. There's tons of connectors out of the box that you can use to automate things on your desktop, and it works really nicely with Power Automate. You can already use that inside of GCC and GCC High today. That ability is coming to the DoD, hopefully by the end of this calendar year. The other thing to keep in mind here too is you may have noticed that there was an announcement that with Windows 10, there are uh, free use rights to be able to use Power Automate Desktop locally on your machine. Unfortunately, today, if you're using a government identity, something in GCC, GCC High, or DoD, that capability is not there today. That is something the product group is aware of, and hopefully that'll get resolved soon, but today that's not there. If you would like to be able to use your government identity and play around with Power Automate Desktop, reach out to me on LinkedIn. We do have a process to issue trial licenses of Power Automate per user RPA attended, and that would give you the ability to start playing around with Power Automate Desktop with one of those government cloud identities. The other thing that's new in terms of RPA is Process Advisor. And so here's the timeline for that as well in the various cloud regions. Process Advisor is pretty cool because what it enables you to do is you can actually create a way that people in your organization can record a similar action that they're doing. Maybe there's some kind of process that's very manual intensive, and you can enable people to actually then record those actions, share those to a single place, and then you can analyze the results of that. And what this will do is then it'll tell you, here's some high priority things that you could do to automate that to save the time for the people that are today doing these things manually. And it'll categorize things so that you can actually break it down by, these are high priority things to automate, because these are the things that actually take the longest for people to do. And we got the timeline there. Um, pending on DoD, we don't have a timeline quite yet for that. Power Virtual Agents, which Brad is going to talk in much more in depth shortly, um, already available today in GCC. Um, we don't have a timeline quite yet for GCC High or DoD, but, but stay tuned on that. And I'll, I'll, save, uh, I'll save all the cool stuff of PVA for, uh, for Brad here in a few minutes. Dataverse or Teams very soon is going to be coming for GCC. We'll then shortly follow GCC High. We're still waiting to kind of get some more details around DoD, but another kind of cool integration that will be available in our government clouds very soon. The other one that I'm pretty excited about, the Center of Excellence Toolkit. So um, that's just an open source uh, tooling that you get a lot of really cool governance around uh, managing the Power Platform. You can use that in GCC, and we just tested this the other day in GCC High, also works in GCC High as well. 
Um, we're waiting to kind of test this in DoD as well, so stay tuned on that. But you can absolutely use those in GCC and GCCI today. The last one I wanted to cover here is really just around governance, um, specifically DLP policies. And if you've ever used that, effectively what that allows you to do is define which things are business categories and which things are non-business, and you can't mix the two together. Which was awesome, but people had asked, you know, is there any way we can have more fine-grained control? Can we actually lock down a specific action? Or can we lock down a specific namespace to a SQL Server database? That's coming, that's available in preview today in commercial. And the timeline for that showing up into the government cloud is here, uh, should be this summer that you'll see that across the board in our three different government clouds. Last thing I wanted to share here is that we also have a connector request form. This is public, anybody can go to this. If you or your customers are using any of these government clouds we're talking about, and you're currently missing a key connector that you would like to have that's in commercial, but it's not in one of the government clouds, aka.ms slash connector request, you can submit that. This goes directly to the product group, and then this is how they're actually prioritizing which connectors they're working on to release into our different government clouds. Another thing, just really quickly, I started doing a YouTube channel back in the fall. It became kind of a little passion of mine. It's been a fun little hobby during COVID. A lot of the demos that we'll show later on with AI Builder, I've put together videos on that as well. The other thing that we've done as a team, which is something I'm really excited about as well, is on GitHub, we now have an open source federal business applications repository. Anybody can go to this. And what we've done is we've put together a bunch of different samples that run in our various different government cloud environments. Most of these demos have a solution file you can download, and then you can just import into your environment and get started really quickly. A lot of these also have a YouTube video associated with that as well, and then there's a write-up of how you can get started really quickly. We also have some white papers too, and so those are things where there's maybe some cross-cutting concerns. The very first thing I talked about is something that we've actually got a white paper on too, of a workaround when you're in GCC and you wanna consume Azure commercial resources. We've got that out there. And as we get more things like that, we'll definitely put that out there too. The other thing, the one last thing that I'm really excited about here is that what's also cool about GitHub is this is not just a Microsoft employee contributing content out here, but we can also take pull requests too. So if you or your customers have something interesting you think would be like really good to share with the community, you're totally welcome to do that. Just fork the GitHub repo, submit a pull request, we can review that, and then we can get that added to the, the repository as well. And with that, we're now going to switch gears over to Brad, and Brad's going to do a deep dive on PVA and also do a demo of that as well. All right, thanks, Steve. So I can get rid of that there. All right. So um, as Steve mentioned, I'm going to cover Power Virtual, virtual Agents. Now, I've added a few things to it. We're going to go show a little bit of that integration work with Dynamics itself, as well as a little bit of Omnichannel with that, a little bit about how that functions. Um, this any one of those three things could be their own demonstration in and of itself. But what I want to do is I want to give you at least a little bit of an idea of what the product looks like if you're not familiar with it, how it integrates with Dynamics as well as with Omnichannel. Okay, more so to kind of get you exposed to it. If you need to do more research or reach out to us, we can help from there as well. So the product itself is it's it's. It's basically lets you create powerful chatbots um, that they can answer questions on behalf or posed by your organization. So think of customer service. Think about what you're probably doing today with your bank. Um, I've had airlines who have moved over to having bots. Uh, banks, actually specifically with an airline, it, I had some baggage that was lost. I was shocked that the baggage claim group actually had a bot that was kind of helping me out with my with my particular case that I was, you know, meanwhile I'm in Target trying to find a whole wardrobe for four days. So a lot of things, a lot of people are moving forward with that. We've introduced that as well. Uh, my particular customer has been a, a very heavy force in driving some of the uh, work that we've done on some of the dates because they're a very large organization. Um, but basically what it is, is that we're basically enabling, you know, employees and visitors on your website and your services through a bot technology. All right, that bot technology is one that does not require a data scientist or developers um, you can actually basically empower subject matter, sub, subject matter experts or business level people. So if you've got an organization, a financial organization who, you know, you have specific people who deal with this, this level of financial um, uh, questions, 
they can actually manage their own version of you know what the bot may interact with and have a separate bot for that function. Again, it's a no-code graphical interface that we'll show. Um, and again, you don't need the developers and you don't need the data scientists to actually get this up and running. Uh, some of the ways that we've seen, specifically from the government or just across the board on where uh, power virtual agents have come into place, are COVID-19 infection rate and tracking information. So pulling some of that in. Um, helping on the sales support side, uh, providing information related to open hours and store information. You know, Best Buy, for example, you can go to uh, Best Buy can tell you where their stores are. Uh, employee health vaccination benefits. So a lot of things that you want to offload that you're going to be more of your repetitive task that you want a normal bot to manage, except you can do so within the Power Platform with a bot that doesn't require coding, doesn't require the bot framework to at least get up and running as a start. Um, another one, you know, common employee questions for businesses. So an internal bot, you can have those functions as well. Power virtual agents can also connect to your backend system with just a few clicks. Uh, there's hundreds of connectors. So a lot of the same connectors that you're seeing through Power Automate um, as well, you know, within a flow. Uh, whatever it is that you need to do, most of those connectors are available as well. Or you can call custom APIs, custom workflows using flow as well. Now, when we talk about the productivity increases that we've had with organizations, we've seen just as an organization, um, and this is more in, within the industry, 70% uh, of organizations basically saw a reduction of, you know, in, in terms of their actual chat and their email inquiries after influencing virtual agents. Okay, so what that means is, is that they're able to offload on the customer service side where I sit primarily at Microsoft um, with my giant customer is their goal, although you'd never see it published, would be to offload some of those interactions with a quote unquote customer to have some self-service. Now that becomes a low cost way to actually manage. Now, if I've got X number of agents answering or taking phone calls or providing customer service, if I can offload 70% of that, I can reuse the other portion of those uh, individuals to actually help address customers. I mean, through COVID, you know, I'm getting shocked as now when I'm, you know, put a phone call in to a bank or something. I'm out on hold for two hours. You know, is it's been that bad. Now I'm starting to see that time come down because we've all offering some of those self-service features as well. 66% of customers of these organizations um, are able to solve, and that's because 66% of those and those customers can actually solve their own issues, their own questions just on their own, whether that's the bot actually answering the question itself or the bot sending them to a knowledge base article or just the bot in general, just assisting them in the way that they feel is appropriate in getting their questions answered. Now, when we move on, we start talking about, you know, what can you do with Power Virtual Agents? We can make it personal. OK, you can engage naturally. All right. So employees, it's a conversation that you can actually have with the bot uh, routine, you know, Issues you can resolve instantly. You know, the staff can focus on more complex matters that do require that research as an agent. It can engage anywhere and all day long. So if your organization pretty much closes up shop on your call center at 10 p.m., the bot can actually work within your website and start helping people over those later hours and overnight. Again, you can engage on multiple applications. Our omni-channel solution will work also, and um, you can actually use the you can use Power Virtual Agents in a number of things, mobile apps, Facebook, Teams, more, both internal and external to your organization. And it's really easy to get started as well. Now, moving on, you can empower your people. So now your people within your organization, those SMEs who are going to develop that content, those SMEs that are going to normally have to write that, you know, only own that knowledge base, can actually start in the process of the business side of actually building in and, and organizing that those bots to answer those questions. Again, to separate from something like the power of the bot framework itself, we're not requiring code at this point. So your users, your SMEs, your business can actually start developing out power virtual agents as well to kind of help along with the way, uh, help along answer those questions. Again, we've got your continuous growth and improvement. You've got metrics that are coming out as well. And you don't have to train custom models because some of that AI is built within the tool as well and some of the tuning. Taking advantage of technology, it's the benefit of SaaS. I mean, purely the benefit of SaaS. Um, the infrastructure is hosted, obviously, within Microsoft. Your build, your deploy, your update, you're also having to take advantage of, you're able to take advantage of the SaaS implementation of Power Virtual Agents. 
And you still have the power of the full bot brain framework. It's basically the more friendly UI over top of something that is the bot framework. And we can still take action again. Okay, a few clicks. Um, we've got access to those connectors. We can make those eight custom API calls and use uh, Power Automate well along the way. Now, the typical life cycle, and I'll go through this pretty quickly, is you're going to create that bot using that simple UI. You're going to build that bot. You're going to implement exactly what you want in that bot, whether it's FAQs. If you're not familiar with Q&A Maker, for example, you can actually ingest. If you already have a, a, a Q&A on your website, uh, basically, you can ingest either directly from that, and the system will create topics around those individual questions and answers, or you can use something like Q&A Maker on the Azure side. I like to use that personally for backup. So if my bot can't address every single question, I might have our organization's uh, question and answer, and if it can find a suitable answer, it may propose that to that person as well through the bot itself. Obviously, we've got learning with natural language, uh, variables can also be extracted from that as well, and those, like, those variables can be used across the board and moved even in Dynamics and an Omnichannel. We can also configure the backend APIs with Power Automate, as I mentioned, enhancing the bill, the bot too. So we've got the skills for complex scenarios, and that might be an Azure skill of some type on the bot framework. And we can publish those bots to a number of different channels as well. And then finally, we want to monitor the performance of the bot to see, you know, what, how is this bot impacting us? That's where we get our metrics from. How do we know the effectiveness of the bot? Where do we need to tune the bot to actually support the organization a little bit better? Again, built on the uh, power of the platform, uh, power platform as well as the bot framework. And along that, there's the connectors. Uh, that list is growing. You're probably all pretty familiar with that list. All right, so in the theme of the GCC, there are a couple limitations. To me, there's not a lot, but there's a couple. The first one is being the power of virtual agents analytics, and the second being the Microsoft Teams app experience for GCC specifically. Um, basically, that is the out of box. So you do get a level of dashboards with power virtual agents. Okay, and it does give you some of the metrics, sessions, ongoing sessions, engagement rates, just various things that you can see right there in the quick screenshot. There is a workaround for that, though, and of course, that workaround would be Power BI. And internally, Microsoft has, has actually produced, and there's a link to that too, some of the dashboards available from Power BI to replace that for GCC or even on the commercial side as well. Um, but basically, there is a workaround for that. The second one's taking a little bit more of an effort. Okay, and that effort is because of just some of the nuances associated with the with the government cloud, and for for some of that around the um, the Teams app experience for GCC. All right, so any questions on that? I'm going to start getting queued up for the demo. All right, so what I'm going to cover um, is going to be these subjects here. So, okay, basically in in terms of the live demo, power vir virtual agents in Dynamics 365, portals via chat from Omnichannel. That's, the, I guess, the proper way to say it. I have fun writing these. Power virtual agents routing to agents via Omnichannel. Power virtual agents standalone. And I, this last one made me laugh. Power virtual agents authoring power virtual agents. Didn't mean it to kind of combine that way, but I had fun with it anyway. So, you know, we'll go ahead and go with it because I thought it was fun. All right. So now I'll switch over to live demonstration here. And you'll have to bear with me as you can see my slides. Um, I basically had a computer failure. <laughs> so now I am uh, kind of got piece mailing monitors with the laptop. All right, so what I'm on today is some demonstration work that I had done, uh, oh gosh, over the course of the last maybe year and a half, two years. And what this is is obviously a Dynamics portal. And over here we've got our Omnichannel, so our chat feature of Omnichannel. Now I can start, I'm not actually in Power Virtual Agents, but some of the routing is going to occur from side of this. This is just a pre-chat survey. All right, I'm going to be Ted. I've been Ted Bailey for quite over a year and a half is my stage name. And Bailey.com. And I'm going to specifically pick clinical for this example because that's actually going to go into the clinical queue. And I have a bot that monitors a power virtual agent bot monitoring the clinical queue inside of Dynamics within Omnichannel. We'll submit that. What it's going to do now, it's basically the system, and I'm really showing you how this works, um, but we'll move on to showing you inside of Power Virtual Agents. First thing the system can do is it can say, hey, I can see that you're logged in, Ted. Um, in this case, that's my health event. We'll go ahead and say, yes, we are. 
Great, if I can speak to a human agent at any time, I do have that ability to go to a live agent. So this is the actual Power Virtual Agent. This particular Power Virtual Agent is called Virtual Agent VC3 Clinical Bot, because this is a clinical bot in, that lives in the clin clinical queue inside of Dynamics. If you'd like to speak with an agent at any time, but how might I help you? Well, let's see. I have a question on an appointment. All right, I can see that you have an appointment with Dr. Martin at the Cleveland Medical Center in four weeks on September 17th. That's kind of far out. That's not what I'm looking for, but we'll go ahead and say no. The bot, okay, well, how may I help you? Um, I'm having some eye pain. All right. You can repeat that. Uh, I see that you're having an issue. Um, can I ask you some questions? Sure. Any new allergies? No. All right, the following address. So I can, the system can go out into Dynamics or another third party tool and verify it because we know we've authenticated Ted, he's logged in. Yes, I'm still at that address. All right, and we can go in a little bit more here, but basically the system's going to start asking me if I want to upload a picture. Um, in this case, in the demonstration, the live demonstration I did with my customer, um, we would actually upload a eye, a picture of like a hurt eyeball, basically. So using that, we'll skip through that. I'm not going to go through all that right now. I'll receive your upload. Okay. Power Virtual Agent is going to send that into Dynamics. Okay. Now it's telling me an agent will be with you in a moment because obviously the bot can no longer help me at this point. Now the scenario that we went live with this um, for my customer was is that we actually had uh, – it was clinical nature, so we'd have a, um, a nurse who would come in and play the second part of that. Now what I'm in right now is the conversation dashboard of Omnichannel. OK, I can see that I have a chat request from Ted Bailey, visitor one, and I can see some information associated with that. We're not going to go too much further into this, but just give you an idea that the bot can actually do that. What that is within Power Virtual Agents is that handoff to a live agent. The bot's done everything they can do. They could have solved this issue potentially. The bot could have potentially solved it. This just happens to be something that needs to go over to a live agent. And from here, I would have to just accept this as now in the persona of an agent in Dynamics. I would accept that, and I, as a human being, could actually start working on this particular example. The conversation that I had with the Power Virtual Agent, with the bot itself, is going to be listed out here as well, across the way. And, of course, we've got our normal things we'd expect, um, such as sentiment analysis and the ability to kind of move forward with what we want to do. All right? I'll stop there. Now we're in Omnichannel. Now we're in customer engagement. A whole other conversation, but just give you an idea of how – Power Virtual Agents can be used in this exact scenario. Now what we'll do is we'll move over to Power Virtual Agents and look at that specific bot. But before I do that, any questions thus far? All right, so we'll start here. Uh, I'm inside a Power Virtual Agent, and this is the authoring canvas for Power Virtual Agent. Over here to the left, I've got some various areas that I can go in. Across the top, I can see the multiple bots Again, I showed you the bot by name. That's the VC3 clinical bot. Just to validate that, go back over to the portal. VC3 clinical bot as a virtual agent. That is the exact bot that I'm in right now. All right. I've got some things over here, such as our topics. All right. And the topics are how you want to, whatever it is that you want to use to kind of do that. Now, these are just kind of test scenarios that I've done. Some of them turned on, some of them not. Um, I've tried different formats of how to do it. But over here to the left, I can even start testing this out as well. Like if I want to test my bot. So I'm outside of Dynamics. I'm outside of the portal. I'm in bot creation completely at this point. Let's look at the greeting and we can see what that looks like. Well, before we do that, let's go ahead and look at the, the metrics. So we've got analytics. Again, this is the feature that we'd have to pull into Power um, uh, Power BI today until we resolve this on the Microsoft side. But basically, I can see analytics around that particular bot. Total sessions has popped in. There's eight total sessions. I have a CSCAT score. Various things that can just already just naturally happen because we've got that integration between our portal, Dynamics, and our Power Virtual Agent. All right, we'll go out of that, and we'll go ahead and look exactly at the greeting, okay, which was the starting point for that conversation. So on the website, I left from the pre-chat survey, and then I brought the bot into the chat window, and the bot continued to have the conversation with Ted. There's our question right there. So as I showed you on the portal side, ask a question. I'm a virtual agent. How can I help you? 
This is just a simple question that I added in here with multiple types of answers that we can use. In this case, I used uh, a Boolean of just a yes or no. And when I do that, that starts creating this tree here. And uh, this would be our yes side. Let's see if I can shrink that down a little bit. Our no side, and I can continue that conversation. Now here, I pretty much orphaned everything out at the no side, but we did continue with that bot with Ted, and basically it went down this way, and down this path here, and I could start seeing some of the variables are coming to play as well. Then what I did is I redirected to a different topic called the VAC3 talk to an agent, and that was one of the topics that we saw here on the prior page here. Now, if I wanna see what that looks like in the same way that I saw in the website as a part of the authoring of the tool, I can do that as well. Now there's trigger phrases. Now I went through the bot itself, but these trigger phrases could also be used to just to say, hello agent or whatever else. I could have had another one that said like, and you probably saw the name, hey, I'm having some type of an emergency, I need help. I can automatically send that out, Power Virtual Agent based off a trigger phrase of keywords. In that case, it might not be a good keyword and I can immediately send in this case, that veteran over to a different group, okay, who can immediately help that veteran in need right there on the spot. But what we're going to do here is we'll just show you what that kind of looks like if I want to see what that uh, that flow kind of um, is. So we'll say here, I can just use the trigger phrase of hello. Okay, and it's going to start moving us through that same process that I showed you on the bot side, except I'm in the authoring side of things. All right, I'm going to track between topics that's going to which i have enabled that's going to send me over to the vac3 talk to a doctor a different topic and we'll say appointment all right it's going to change the topic on this side because i'm actually in a different series of topics that's just to give you an idea of what that linking looks like within a specific topic over here on the left i can see again all right that you have an appointment with dr martin the cleveland medical center that is a skill, and this one I don't have it as, as live, but that it can be all that could also just easily be a skill. I have I cheated in the demo and made, hard coded it, but I could have also had a skill which we have in a different demonstration we've been working on, where Power Virtual Agent, okay, looks it, it uses basically a Power Automate flow, and it's using Mapbox, and it basically looks at okay, well where is this particular person living? It goes out to Mapbox and it looks at all the VA medical centers to see what the closest hospital is to that veteran and returns that back over. I hard coded it because it was smoke and mirrors. We weren't getting into this level with that demonstration, but we just wanted to kind of speak to the fact that it can do that as well. As I scroll down here, I can see again my variables, and these variables can be defined as global variables within Power Virtual Agents. Um, we've got a new feature coming out too in Private Preview, which is really nice, and it is first party voice. I was amazed. I started playing around with that in a very early preview um, in December of last year. And it's it's a first party voice channel. So what it does is the first party voice uses Power Virtual Agents. What I mean by that is the voice, if you enable the voice within your organization, it'll actually read from here. Just like if you're calling your bank and you get to the telephony system and it's saying press one, press two, it'll do the same thing, except it's our first party voice solution. It will literally read the text here. So I've got the ability now to get into heavy hitting voice conversations, but it's only using Power Virtual Agents as the back end. That voice, if I call the phone number, it's going to read, hello, you've reached, you've reached uh, the bank of, you know, Utopia. Okay, I see that you have an appointment with an agent here in your particular office. Is that correct? It'll read it exactly as you say, as you see it here. It's very nice. Now, in the interest of time, some of the other things that we can do here is um, these are I'm scrolling through some of what I showed you in the portal. Um, these can be as long, you know, this is the private agent. So I pulled some of those variables and I showed those variables back in dynamics here. That block right there is what we saw within Dynamics in this section right here, because I basically captured all of those within Power Virtual Agents as a variable and just presented those back over to the agent. So this is when you call your bank and you spoke to the, the telephony system and you gave your validation, you said your secret word, whatever it is. That's just another way that we can validate, but we can also reach out too. Now, some of the other features that we can have within here, let me go find another tree that we can work from here. Uh, we'll pick this one. 
Okay, I can ask a question which you've seen a few times. I can call an action. Okay, and what this is, actions are coming from flows. So I had a flow in here, um, which is not live in this particular one. But there's my Q&A maker knowledge base fallback. And what that is, is if I came to the question on the portal side, it'll go back to the Q&A and check that as well. Um, but let's see here. Uh, I think I have one in here for inquiry, inquiry, claim, search. I observed earlier. I, I must have, maybe I didn't turn it back on. But I have a flow. I had a flow in here that will actually go out to Power Automate. We're going to see what it looks like. But effectively, in the Power Automate side, it's exactly what you would see within Power Automate. Um, and what you're going to get is you're going to have a flow that you're going to be that's going to be set up that's going to do the same things you're used to. I had one that would look at claim status. So a veteran's going to go into the organization. They're going to speak back to the bot, and they want to just check the status of their claim. That particular flow would go outside on the Power Automate. It would pull back the claim status after they gave us the claim ID. Pure, nice, great feature, saving a lot of time on those phone calls. So I think that puts me right at about time. Um, I didn't, I know I kind of flew through this, um, but it's a lot to cover and hopefully it gives you an idea of some of the power that we have with Power Automate. Um, again, I started out with kind of talking about how Dynamics 365, you have that chat, you know, with Omnichannel, now we've introduced Power um, Virtual Agents inside of a chat window to work on that case deflection. So we want that case deflection up front if we can. If not, then we can move over to a live agent. And that's when the bot is actually going to start handing off to a live agent. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the routing features that you can also have. Again, that bot lives inside of Dynamics 365, inside of Omnichannel, in the same capacity as an agent. So they literally belong to a queue and they work that queue. So they can work all night, 24 hours a day, Unless they're downtime, they're up, they're working. Also, we talked a little bit about some of the standalone. So if I wanted to go within standalone, I can show you what we do to publish. So let's go out of here. Okay, and some of my options for publishing um, are within channels. Okay, I can do Microsoft Teams, a demo website, which this would allow me to kind of play with it and provide that link. Custom websites, mobile apps, Facebook, Skype, Cortana, Slack, Telegram, Kick. Line, Twilio, GroupMe, which I've used with my friends, email, you name it. A lot of features where you can actually have that, and that would be that standalone aspect where you're not using Dynamics, not required. You're not using Omnichannel, not required. But I just want to have a bot that's sitting out there and helping people out. It could just be a Facebook. Um, for my customer, we even did a portion of the demo where there's a, a, power, it's a, a power virtual agent that lives in Facebook. And somebody's in Facebook, they go out to Veteran Affairs, and they want to ask a question, works the exact same way, in the same way that we saw within the Dynamics portal itself. And then finally, we talked a little bit about some of the authoring, and I went as quickly and smoothly as I could, but some of the authoring canvas that I'm showing you here as well. And all you simply are doing is you're publishing these out. Um, I've got a lot in here, goodbye. Some of these are canned messages. Uh, suggested topics as well, and that's where you can enter that link into. And I want to broke all content from an existing website. A lot of power. So in the time that we have, I just want to kind of go through that. I think I'm right at my time limit. But any questions in the minute I have before we switch back over to whoever's next? I guess Kyle and you. I have a question, but I think it might take longer than a minute to answer. <laughs> There's no time limit, just to be clear. So ask away. So my question, uh, first off, I, I think this is brilliant. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to go through the demonstration. Uh, but my question would be, so I've, um, I'm have i familiar with Power Virtual Agents. I, I think it's a really, really powerful software to reduce overhead when it comes to call center services, right? Because that's that's really the use case there, right? Like if you're, if you would use it, chances are you have been using it, but probably with some sort of antiquated telephony system where like, supporting call center agents is some sort of very expensive thing that you support. Um, so previously I worked with a client where we had call centers all over the world, um, 70 plus countries operating in over 30, 30 different languages. So you can imagine we, we had like a very large canned response database of, you know, things that had been established that were dictated as that this is how you shall answer this question. So my question is, uh, you mentioned the potential for bulk creation of topics. So I would see that as being the biggest blocker on getting the time to market is if I have a very evolved 
business use case where I have, you know, hundreds of thousands of responses in multiple languages. Could you talk a little bit about the bulk creation of those topics to try and reduce that time frame? Yeah, sure. I mean, you've got a couple different options. I, mean, I mentioned really two, and I'm about to show one as soon as this paints up, okay? Now, what that is, is you've got the Q&A Maker, which is an Azure service. Q&A Maker allows you to basically take a spreadsheet. So this may not be, the, I don't think this is going to be the level that you may be looking for, but if I have a spreadsheet of questions and answers or a, a potential white paper, depending on that formatting, I can literally ingest that into Q&A Maker inside, which is an Azure service, but Power Virtual Agent can use that as well. Now, what I do with Power Virtual Agents is I use it for fallback. So exam for example, um, this is one, this is actually what I pulled down from a website for COVID. Literally, all I did was point this at a website, and that website literally um, had questions and answers related to COVID, and I pulled one in. So for here, this is one of the examples. Um, can I be tested for COVID-19 at the healthcare facility? It went out literally to this URL, and that question came from that URL, all right? Now, what that does is it's going to create that automatically, and you get pretty much a formatted version of it. The nice thing with this is it's going to send that back to that uh, potential customer in that very specific format. But I'm using it as a fallback. So if I can't answer the question because I'm not created a specific topic, I can do that. It can ingest any number of those. So I don't know if specifically that answers your question, um, but if you're, the organizations you're working with has that level of documentation, you're not having to create all of that. One thing I don't like about it, though, is it's going to create a topic for every question and answer, right? But then it gets into how you do, how do you manage all of that bulk of contact? Like if I pulled every single COVID question for Veteran Affairs, it would be 300 topics. And that's what we're working with, too, with, uh, with, with, with them specifically on how we address that. They're a huge organ organization um, themselves, you know, almost a half a million employees. And obviously, there's a lot of veterans. So probably a very similar use case, but I don't know if that's specifically what you're looking for. Um, but the functionality is there if that organization already has some of that pre-existing content. That's, that's helpful. Thank you, sir. And I had, uh, if we still got a little bit of time, I got one quick AI builder demo if y'all want to see that uh, in GCC High real quick. And we did have one other question about PVA before we move on. And I think we have plenty of time to cover AI Builder unless someone objects. Um, but the question was, can we extend PVA with Bot Framework Composer in GCC? Yes. <laughs> Easy answer, yes. Uh, I think we're good to pass it over to Steve when you are. Awesome. Okay, give me one second here. So what we're looking at here is, once again, this is the Federal Business Applications GitHub repo. And so both samples I'm going to show you live in GCC High are also on our GitHub repo. So you can download this solution that I'm about to show you. There's some notes of how you can use it and how to get set up. And let's go ahead and actually look at this in action. First thing we're doing here, you can notice this URL, make.high.powerapps.us. That is a GCC High specific endpoint or Power Apps, so we're actually running live. What you can also see here is AI Builder models available. The one I'm about to show is the ID Reader model where you can just take a picture of a driver's license. But there's other ones here as well, Invoice, for example, language detection. Um, you can do text translation as well, or just text recognition, take a picture of something. And if there's any text in that picture, it'll automatically get the text out of you. Um, the other one that's really popular is form processing, and that'll be the second demo we'll show here. So here we go. This is the driver license canvas app that's showing off the AI builder driver's license model. And the way that I set this up, you can do two flavors. One is you can use an existing photo, which I'm going to do in this demo, or you could take a new. So that would be if you're on your phone, you just take a picture, scan it, and then it'll go in and process this. I'm going to do existing. And with this, I've actually got a sample set of driver's licenses. And this is also on GitHub. I got this from indeed.com. But basically, there's roughly a sample for every state except for a few. We'll go ahead and choose the Alabama one. Funny side note, there's probably three models for the sample driver's licenses, so you'll see the same people across the different states. I'm going to now go ahead and process that. And under the covers, that's calling Power Automate, which is then going to call the AI Builder model. And the neat thing about this one is it's pre-built in the sense that there's no training at all. 
you just go ahead and use the model and you're off to the races. We just got the results back and now you can see that there's the first name, the last name, the date of birth, the expiration date, which state it was issued. So it even recognizes what type of driver's license it is in the US. And for every one of those, you also get a corresponding confidence value. So it's from zero to one, one would be 100% confidence. And so you can actually then make decisions automatically. Is this something that is of a high enough confidence that you want to process this automatically? Or is it low enough that you want to flag that and have some human look at that to review it before you move on to the next step? So that's the first app. It's out there on GitHub. Feel free to take a look at that. Let's uh, switch gears to the second one. So this next one is going to be also AI Builder. This one is using form processing. And the example here is that I've got this food signup form where a bunch of people have filled this out. Some of them digitally filled them out and they sent me a PDF. Some of them people wrote by hand. They scanned that and they send that to me. And now I've got a collection of these and I need to, in my internal, internal organization, I need to put all that data into this web app. And what I wanna show you is actually how you can automate this end to end. And I think that this is really neat. If you think of the federal government, all of the SF forms, the standardized forms, I think this is an awesome opportunity that we can automate a lot of this manual data entry, both reading data and then entering data into another application. And so what I'm going to show here is actually what I've got here is I've got a power automate flow that's going to process an uploaded image. We're going to do, we'll do this handwritten one, just uh, uh, we'll do the handwritten one for this example. And then what it's going to do is it's going to then locally call up Power Automate Desktop, which is RPA, and you'll see that the result will actually get entered into that web app. Let's look at this end-to-end. -end. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to prompt me for a PDF file. So we'll go ahead and import. Let's go ahead and choose that um, form. All of these forms are also on GitHub too, so you can do this exact same test that I'm doing right here. I'm going to choose the fourth form. We're going to run this. And we'll go ahead and just look at this live to see what's going on here. So we'll see that this is running. In a second, we should see that then it does the AI builder step, which is really just calling form processing. The next thing is going to be locally, we're going to see RPA running on this machine. So in a second, we'll see um, the Internet Explorer launch up. And if I had my camera on, you would see my hands are up. I'm not doing anything. It's automatically populating that form with the data it extracted from AI builder. And then it submitted that form automatically end to end, right? And so none of that, I had to do any manual entry. So you can imagine if you had another process where maybe you're getting emails of these files, you could trigger off of that and kick off this thing where it just automatically end to end extracts the data, enters the data, submits the data. And you can do all of that now inside of GCC High. Those are the two demos that I had. Um, that's the last last part of this. Once again, that's all out on GitHub. If you got any questions, uh, put them in the chat or feel free to, to ask away. What about uh, licensing? So, and that's always the thing we need a doctorate in, right? So what what things must be true to leverage that technology? Great, uh, great question. Yeah, I should have brought that up. So Thank you, Steve. effectively what you need for AI Builder is you need AI Builder credits. Those Credits are, are capacity. The capacity credits are added to an environment. Two ways to get those. One is you get a SKU, which is the AI Builder add-on capacity, which gives you a million AI Builder uh, service operations. Now, um, there is a document, and I can put that in the chat below or I'll follow up later. Every single operation you do with AI Builder consumes some amount of those credits. And I forget what the exact number is, but I think we've got that published. The other way you can get AI Builder credits is actually if you get Power Automate per user with attended RPA, that will also give you some AI Builder credits. Now, it's not going to be a lot. It would be like enough to give you um, 10 form processing uh, pages per month. So if you want to do that for real, you probably would want to do the AI Builder capacity add-on. Or if you had a lot of Power Automate RPA per user licenses, that would actually give you a collection of probably a lot more AI Builder credits too. Does that answer your question though? It does, sir, thank you. And by the way, yeah, so if you took this demo, uploaded it into your environment, 
if you don't assign AI builder credits, you will get an error. And so it might be a little confusing. I've tried to put some documentation there on our GitHub repo, but just one thing you just want to be mindful of. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate having you guys here. I think this was a really great, um, interesting session and great questions from everybody. So I know we all really appreciate it. Um, I did drop the links for our upcoming events in our communities in the chat and, you know, feel free to connect with anybody on the call and stay up to date on future events that we have.